These little SD cards seem so simple, right? But they've got all these markings and so many different specs. What do they all mean? I'm going to tell you on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey everyone, welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions on Adorama TV. If you've got a question, just go to askdavidbergman.com and submit that form right there on the site. If it's one that I think is going to help a lot of other photographers, I just might pick your question to answer here on a future show. This week I've got a good question from Clark A and he wants to know, I need to buy a new SD card for my camera, but there are way too many options. Can you explain what all the numbers mean and let me know which one to buy? Thanks Clark for sending that in. I'm totally with you that it can be super confusing. There are so many different types of cards, speeds, and specs, so I'll do my best to help you out. Now just to be clear, what we're talking about here are the little cards, just like this one here, um, that you put in your camera to temporarily store your images until you can move them off to a computer. Now while different cameras use different types of cards, many of the most popular bodies out there take SD cards. For example, my Canon EOS R3 right here has two different slots in it. One of them does take SD cards and the other is CF Express. Now you can use either type or both in this particular camera. Now this smaller EOS uh, M50 for, on the other hand only has one slot and it's SD only. Now all of these little cards are kind of like m miniature SSD drives. They're flash memory so there's no moving parts and that makes them more robust than a traditional spinning hard drive. If you drop them, they're usually going to be fine. One time I even left one in my pants pocket and accidentally ran it through the washing machine. Now while I wouldn't recommend doing that, I actually was able to get all of the images off of there after it dried out so they hold up pretty well. Now, while you can insert an SD card into your computer and store any type of data on these things, they're most often used in cameras to shoot stills and video. SD stands for secure digital and SD cards come in different physical sizes. In addition to the standard size SD, you might also see mini SD or micro SD cards right here. Mini SD isn't very common, but smaller devices like drones and cell phones often use these tiny micro SD cards. Normal size DSLR and mirrorless cameras tend to take the standard sized SD card. No matter which size you're using though, if you look closely at an SD card, you're going to see a bunch of markings all over them. This one is from the company I use for all of my digital cards and readers, ProGrade Digital. I'm going to explain what each one of those markings actually means and then I'm going to tell you which ones are important and which ones you can ignore before you buy a new SD card. Now the first one is really the most obvious, the storage capacity of the card. This is listed in megabytes, gigabytes, or even can be in terabytes. This one has a lot of space on it, it's 256 gigabytes. Cards with lots of storage space are going to give you freedom to shoot more pictures or video without worrying about filling up your card too quickly. I can store thousands and thousands of frames on here. Now of course more space is more cost, but my recommendation is usually to buy as much as you can afford. No one has ever complained about having too much storage space. Now you can see in the bottom left corner that this card also says SDXC. The first SD cards just said SD on them. They came out in 1999 and only had a maximum capacity of 2 gigabytes. That was all the spec would allow when it was first invented. As cameras started to shoot bigger and bigger files, 2 gigabytes just wasn't enough, so they came up with a new spec. In 2006, the SDHC format was announced. That stands for Secure Digital High Capacity. SDHC cards have capacities of anything more than 2 gigabytes up to 32 gigabytes. That was a huge amount of space at the time, but as you can imagine, there was a de demand for bigger and bigger cards. In 2009, we got this type. SDXC, Secure Digital Extended Capacity, which is for capacities of more than 32 gigabytes up to 2 terabytes. That is massive, right? Well, that still might not be enough for some modern video cameras that shoot 8K video, for example. Recently, they did add one more spec, SDUC, Secure Digital Ultra Capacity. Those cards can have capacities for more than 2 terabytes up to 128 terabytes. That is a lot of data, at least for now. I'm sure before we know it, we'll be complaining how small even that is. Now you might think that since these cards all have the same exact physical size, that you can use any SD card in any device that it'll fit. But newer cards are actually not backwards compatible with older devices. Just check the manual of your device to be sure. But for example, I have the Zoom H4n Pro audio recorder, and even though the Pro model came out in 2016, it's still based on the older H4n that only takes SD or SDHC cards. That means that you can only use cards up to 32 gigabytes in that unit. 
And yes, I know there's some of you out there that are going to point out that it's possible to format bigger cards with the FAT32 file system and use them in an SDHC device. I'm really just talking about the capacities available in the cards as they're produced and sold by the major, major manufacturers. If you're the type of person who likes to jump through some hoops and force a square peg into a round hole, then knock yourself out, but you already know what you're doing there. Now, next is the card's read speed. This one says read is 300 megabytes per second. Speeds like this are usually listed in megabytes with a capital B and not as megabits, which uses a lowercase b. Uh, read speed is the maximum speed that you can read data from that card. So when you're copying images from the card to your computer, that's your read speed. Now below that is the write speed. That's how fast you can write to the card. For photographers, that usually gives an indication of how fast the pictures are written from your camera's internal buffer to the card as you're shooting them. The faster that data moves, the faster the buffer is going to be able to be cleared and the sooner you can start shooting again. Now for both read and write speeds, keep in mind that what's printed is the maximum speed. There are a number of other factors that can affect the actual speeds you're going to get. It's a bit of a marketing gimmick because it's sometimes going to say on the box that you can get up to whatever megabytes per second. Some companies don't even print the write speed on their card. Since write speed is usually slower than read speed, it just looks better to only print that higher number. Now, ProGrade prints both read and write. Uh, the write speed on this one is 250 megabytes per second, just like the read speed. That, however, is the maximum that this card can do. Now, by the way, you may have seen some cards that have their speed listed on the box as something like 133X or X633 or something like that. Those are not an official spec by the SD Association, but they're basically marketing terms to make their cards sound really fast, which they actually really are. 1X is the speed of an original music CD. That was how fast that data could be read. If a card says it's 133 times that, that's a maximum read speed of 133 times the speed of an original audio CD. Now, the next marking on this card is the speed class. That spec is going to tell you the maximum sequential write speed of the card. These days, that's mostly important for video because you need data to be consistently written from the camera to the card at a very high speed. If it slows down too much, you're going to get errors and your dropouts while you're shooting video. Now, because the class rating tells you the minimum speed, you know that you won't go below that speed. Now, there are up to three different types of speed classes that could be printed on the card. New types were added as speeds got faster and faster. The first ones are listed as a number inside the letter C, and it can be a 2, 4, 6, 8, or 10. That tells you that the card has a guaranteed minimum sequential write speed of 2, 4, 6, 8, or 10 megabytes a second. Then they came out with the UHS speed classes, which are listed as a number inside the letter U. Those are only uh, two options, right? One is 10 megabytes a second, and three is 30 megabytes a second. And now we also have cards labeled with a video speed class. You can have V6, which is six megabytes a second, and it goes up from there with V10, V30, V60, and V90, all available as options. V90 obviously is going to give you a minimum sequential write speed of 90 megabytes per second. That is really fast. Um, and if you look at this chart created by the SD Association, they're the ones that actually make all this stuff up, you'll see that there's some overlap. In theory, when the video speed classes started to be used, that's the V numbers, we didn't really need the older, uh, the older ones anymore. However, if they just stopped using the UHS speed class ratings, it could actually cause a lot of confusion. Well, even more than we already have, because you wouldn't be able to compare apples to apples, and people might think that a UHS speed one card can't be used in a device that asks for V10 cards, even though that's actually the exact same speed. So you'll see all the labels on the cards now. This ProGrade card is a V90, which means it can sustain 90 megabytes per second, but it also still says U3 and C10, which are the fastest speed class ratings available for those other two types. It can go much faster than C10, but there's no C rating higher than that. So if you're using a device that says you need a C10 card, you might not be sure that you can use a V90. So that's why they go ahead and print all three of them on there. I hope that makes sense. It's a bit crazy, but that's the way it goes. Now then there's also the bus speed class. This tells you the maximum throughput of the card's bus interface. The bus is kind of like the highway that the data rides on to get onto the card. There's the ultra high speed or UHS bus interface, and then there's a newer one called SD Express. But the majority of cards out today typically use UHS-1 or UHS-2. UHS-3 does exist, but you rarely see it. 
The bus speed class is indicated on the card by the Roman numeral 1 or 2 for UHS 1 or 2. You can also tell the difference by simply flipping the card over. UHS 1 only has one row of contacts, and UHS 2 and 3 have two rows, so the data can move back and forth much faster. However, you do need to have a device that works with UHS 2 or 3, or you won't be able to use that second row anyway. Now, if your head isn't already spinning, this ProGrade card has one last marketing uh, marking on it that none of the other brands are going to have. That big R logo with an arrow inside means that it's compatible with ProGrade's Refresh Pro software. And one of the reasons I love their products is because of this Refresh Pro. It allows you to check the health of your card and perform a quick factory restore. Cards can wear down over time, and they get what someone called data rot. I'll admit that I don't understand exactly how it works, but I know it's not the same as formatting the card when you use this software. What the software does is it resets something in the card that wipes out all the data and makes it just like the day it came out of the factory. It keeps the card running at peak performance and extends the lifespan. I use it a few times a year on all my cards and have never had any issues with my cards, knock on wood. Okay, so that's everything printed on the label of this particular SD card. Sorry about throwing out all of that data at you, at you, but Clark asked what it means. Now that I've done all that, what should you really care about when buying a card? Well, the first thing is capacity. Make sure you get enough space so that you don't have to worry about running out of cards in the middle of a photo shoot. Back in the old days of 10, 20 years ago, some photographers used to worry about having really big cards because they didn't trust having all of their images in one place in case that card got corrupted. These days, I think some cameras have two slots in them so you can shoot to both cards at the same time and have an immediate backup. Also, card technology has really gotten much better and with software like Refresh Pro, you're less likely to have a corrupt card or a situation where you can't recover the images. It's still possible, so it's up to you if you're comfortable with one big card or getting multiple smaller ones. After that capacity decision, I'd say the only other thing to even bother looking at is the speed class. And that's really way more important if you're shooting video. Going back to that chart from the SD Association, for standard definition video, you can pretty much use the slowest cards out there. If you're shooting 4K, you might get away with using a V10 card, but a V30 or a V60 is going to be much safer. If you're planning to do 8K, just go with V90 for sure. Get as fast as you can in that case. Now, for still photographers like me, speed class is generally a non-issue, especially if you're only shooting single frames. For long, high-speed bursts, the faster cards are going to do a much better job keeping up with you and are going to clear your buffer quicker, as I mentioned earlier. A V30 should be more than enough speed, even when you're shooting the fastest still photography bursts currently possible. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about all those other specs unless you're really doing something with incredibly demanding data needs, like, for example, running a computer operating system off an SD card. Clark, I hope that helps you. Uh, thanks for sending in that question. Thanks, everyone else, for watching through this whole thing. I know it was a long, a long video with a lot of data. Um, but if you're not already a subscriber to the Adorama YouTube channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button below. Use the bell icon so you'll be the first to know as soon as new videos come out all week long from all the hosts right here on Adorama TV. I hope to see you back here next time when I've got a brand new question to answer right here on Ask David Burton.